Hello and welcome to Around the Lens episode 75. Around the Lens is your live weekly visual journalism roundtable show coming at you every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm your host, David J. Murphy. I do this show with my co-host, Zach Roberts. Zach. Hey, David. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, you can head on over to AroundTheLens.com. You can follow us on Facebook at ATL Podcast, on Instagram at Around the Lens, and on Twitter at a round lens and Dave, I believe we have a uh, uh, a contest this month. What? Why yes. am I just now hearing about this? <laughs> just kidding. Yes, uh, we're doing our May contest. It's all about giving away three copies. That's three count of copies. So three possible winners of the book by Carl Johnson. Uh, what's the name of that book, Robert? Zach? Robert, what? <laughs> Get my name right first. <laughs> I don't know who it anyone is. is. <laughs> It is, um, one second, I just want to always make sure that I get it right because I, I screw it up a bunch of times. Uh, yeah, it's like Where Water is Gold. Yes, Where Water is Gold, uh, yeah. about Bristol Bay um, and the uh, community that may be uh, affected by the po possibility of the Pebble Mine, uh, which is one of the going to be potentially one of the largest uh, uh, gold and mineral uh, mines in the world, um, all in an earthquake zone. Oh, and by the way, also like a quarter of the world's wild salmon. You know, what could oh possibly gosh. go wrong? Oh, man. <laughs> Everything. Uh, so how do you win these books? Uh, Ron, do you know how to win these books? I believe you can enter through our website. Isn't that correct, David? And maybe yeah. uh, like a video or make a comment, something like that? Uh, good try, Ron. Good try. All you have to do is three simple things. You have to like the uh, Around the Lens and Carl Johnson's uh, Alaskan... Facebook page. I'm sorry, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but you will find that link on the uh, the show notes. Uh, so like both of those Facebook pages. Oh, subscribe to our Around the Lens newsletter that we put out once a month. And uh, leave a comment on this post or any post related to the contest that is uh, along the lines of basically saying um, what it is that you, where do you, it would be your most uh, what would be your do dream you place to photograph? <laughs> is yeah, the exact dream. wording of the question. So, dream so what would be? Photograph. Yeah. So whether it be going to Craig Stampley um, of a uh, guest uh, last week said uh, he he wants to go to Antarctica, um, and uh, we've had uh, you know uh, go, go up to Alaska. We've had basically a couple different answers. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> All right, and our second co-host is Ron Ron Hamilton. That's right, folks. I'm Ron Hamilton coming to you live from Hawaii, where I want to assure you that I speak without contradiction when I say you are currently tuned in to the world's premier and foremost visual journalism podcast on the Internet or anywhere in the United States or the world. <laughs> I don't know. Can we can we say around the world? I don't know. There could be like a, a, a Chinese uh, uh, photojournalism podcast or something like that that we just don't know about. So the one, so the only one in English. Sort of in English. That's <laughs> there you go. Qualifier. English there. language. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, uh, our guest tonight is a legendary Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, David Leeson. David, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you're doing today. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me on the show. Um, well, I'm David Leeson, and um, I have 30 plus some odd years in, uh, as a photojournalist and started out in Abilene, Texas, uh, uh, which is where I happen to be at the moment, just visiting. Um, but uh, I, then I went to New Orleans, the Times Picayune there. Times Picayune used to say Times Picayune yeah. slash States Item. It was two papers, evening paper. Uh, those were weird days. They even had an early evening paper, I believe. It was called the Green Sheet, and literally the front page was printed in with green paper. It was very interesting. Wow. So, um, and then finally to the Dallas Morning News, where I spent twenty oh. some odd years there. Um, and I spent uh, a good 20 some odd years um, covering uh, uh, conflicts around the globe. Um, th this was back in the, oh gosh, this was the, for lack of a better way to describe it, the a golden age of photojournalism. Now that's not a reflection on what's being done now because 
I think photojournalists across the country, and if I can't speak for the rest of the world, but certainly for this country, are doing a lot with very little, uh, very little compared to what I used to have, where newspapers were flush with cash, and it was nothing to just, uh, you know, get up and go. So I uh, traveled to some odd 60 some odd countries. And that includes, by the way, just passing three countries. But um, a lot of time, but it was, it was a strange experience because I never considered myself a combat photographer. I mean, that goes to my friends and colleagues that I came to know over the years who really do that, that type of speciality uh, for a living. And that's different than a newspaper photographer who is just simply going there and then coming back and doing daily assignments. And then it may be another six months or heck, even a year. And then all of a sudden you're back somewhere for a couple of months. Um, and then back home. I remember one time, in fact, uh, it was early in my beginning at the Dallas Morning News, and I don't tell Salvador for the elections. Of course, the civil war was still going on, and it was, uh, I, for lack, I don't remember the exact day, but let's just say Wednesday at three o'clock in some tiny village in El Salvador, I was photographing uh, townspeople who had been herded into the cemetery to look at dead rebels that had been killed in a skirmish the night before. Okay, that's a mouthful, but let's just say that it was this poignant scene of these children and adults coming through, filing through one by one and looking down upon the bodies of, I think, five, six, or seven rebels. But those rebels happened to be, oh gosh, one of them looked to be about 13, maybe, and was minus his head, but you could tell by other things. Anyway, whatever. It was just oh, a thing that kind of sticks with you in your brain, um, your mind, your soul. So I come home and the following week, I happened to note that it's a Wednesday at 3 p.m. again, one week afterwards. And where was I? I was at a picnic. Uh, excuse me, not a picnic, excuse me, an Easter egg hunt in Plano, Texas, watching kids scurrying for chocolates, right? <laughs> I don't know. I've been sort of strange like this. I should have kept my mouth shut. But I turned to this woman. I just had to, to just mention something to someone, I think, because I needed it. And, and I said, do you know what I was doing last week at this exact same time? And of course, I said, I was photographing dead rebels. Some of them looked to be barely above the age of what we call children. Well, 13 year old be children. She just looked at me and, like, you know, <laughs> well, let's just say the conversation ended. She took off to the other side of the field. But, yeah. um, but that's what I mean by not calling myself a combat photographer, although I'm very often called that. And I certainly don't call anyone out on it um, because who knows, there's various definitions of that. Maybe I don't know, but mine, no, I don't. I I was always very happy, um, proud to be able to call myself exactly what I was. And that's a daily newspaper staff photographer handling both the most benign and most what seemingly benign let's put it that way um assignments and also big huge international assignments and by the way something that should be said that is not quite understood enough is that those assignments make you uh an excellent photographer or a good photographer if you're a bad photographer are your medium or just moderate skills in Dallas, Texas, you're going to be the same in El Salvador or wherever it may be when you cross the channel. In fact, sure, it may feel different because the sights and sounds, it's this uh, overload of, of the senses. It's a sensory overload, as we refer to it. Um, 
as opposed to going to the ladies quilting bee or whatever it may be, or, you know, the mayor's given a speech. It doesn't seem that great. And yet I, my love of photojournalism it didn't have anything to do with the assignment. It didn't have anything to do with where, certainly not where that assignment was. I just enjoyed people. And if there were people there and I had a camera, look, it's always going to be a circus. It's always going to be fun. It's always going to be enjoyable. And there are these amazing stories that people have to say. I'm going to say one last thing. I know it's a long-winded answer to an intro question. Sorry about that, but what the heck. And that's our show, um, folks. All right. Well, follow yeah, up. I know. It's a show. Right? But, but, the, <laughs> but anyway, um, I had, for years, early in my career, I thought, you know what would make a really story would be the story of the average Joe, the average guy, just goes to work every day, comes home, maybe sits in a cubicle all day, has his lunch at noon, checks out at five or six, comes home, wife's got dinner ready, if he's married, whatever, but well, in this case, yeah, the stereotype. And it was so stupid. And this is sort of the way I've learned over the years is that I'll go through that kind of mental process for years and then finally say, that's an impossible thing to do. Impossible. And the reason why, and I believe me, I don't say that about many things. I believe virtually anything is possible. But I like the fact that this one is impossible because when you get to know anyone, doesn't matter who they are, they're interesting. They are extraordinary in many ways. No one's alike. There is no common stereotype per se when you look at it like that. So that's a story I never did, but for good reason. Okay, now I'm done. All right. Well, that's our show. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. And I'd, I'd like to, yeah, let's hear a follow up from that. <laughs> uh, David, well, we're honored to have you on the show tonight. Uh, again, if you. <clears throat> thank you. If you followed any of the, uh, the few promotional items I put out about the show, uh, we were also planning to have Carol Guzzi on tonight, but for whatever reason, she isn't able to join us. But uh, we're still going to have an awesome time talking to you, David. I have tons of questions here. I want to ask a Pulitzer Prize winner. I've never, I don't think, well, no, that's not true. Uh, I have met one Pulitzer Prize winner before, uh, uh, Ron. Uh, no, no, the, he didn't the, win the prize. He was just he a didn't. No, he didn't oh, win. Okay. Well, then, David, you, you have the honor of being my first Pulitzer Prize winner that I've ever met. So uh, congratulations to you. Wow. Um, I, I <laughs> well, know it's a big honor. Good. Well, what is it about, uh, you know, you shake some celebr celebrity, and believe me, I'm not a celebrity. Um, you are to us, but, David. Uh, and, and, well, thank you, but that's very kind. But, um, you know, I'll never wash my hands, so I perhaps then, uh, what, never wash your eyes, so. I'm never washing my computer screen, <laughs> yeah. David. That's, that's what I'm never going to wash. Never going to reboot well, the thank computer. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> but, no, we're really happy to have you on. We have lots of questions to ask you. Uh, again, I, I've never, again, I don't think I've ever met a Pulitzer Prize. I think I've met Pulitzer Prize. I don't even know. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What's cool is does, that we yeah. have a Pulitzer Prize winner on the show. I think you're the first ever Pulitzer Prize winner we've had on the show. Oh, I'm really okay. excited to have you. So, you know, I, I intended for this show almost to be like one of our megasodes where, you know, I get like eight Pulitzer Prize winners and we all talk about uh, what that's like. <laughs> yeah. But, of course, uh, I found out that's a lot harder than I thought to get Pulitzer Prize winners to come on the show. <laughs> um, um. Not, not for not a lot of them. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, not for lack of trying, though. But uh, let's go. Uh, right, well, let's get to know you, David. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll say this right now: ninety nine point nine percent of us who are listening, watching, or have been in this industry are not going to win a Pulitzer Prize. It's extremely prestigious honor, and that's, of course, what lends it such credence. You know, that, and of course, the organization that gives it. But you know, obviously, you have the unique experience of being awarded one. So. You know, we want to get your insights and, and kind of give us some insights that, you know, we, we as the non-Pulitzer Prize winners uh, can have from your experience. So let's start with the first uh, obvious question is, you know, for what story, what photograph did you win the Pulitzer for? Well, it was for a series of images uh, uh, along with my colleague, Cheryl Diaz-Meyer, um, 
about uh, the invasion of Iraq in uh, March, I believe, of 2003. Uh, Cheryl was with the uh, Marines and I was with the Army. And both of us at various times uh, were a tip of the spear. Uh, I've often thought uh, and wondered if perhaps the fact that George Bush uh, was president at the time, and of course a Texan, uh, and we knew for a fact that he read the Dallas Morning News every day in the Capitol uh, at his office. But uh, I wondered if perhaps that's why I where I ended up at the tip of the spear with a really crack, fantastic, well-trained uh, group of teachers. And... Um, and I'm not saying that to flatter them, uh, although it is flattering. Um, I made it very clear um, throughout my experience there that I wasn't there to make them look good. But I wasn't there to make them look bad either. You'll end up wherever you are because I'm just observing and I shoot see if it's worthy of being shot. I mean, you know, not shooting Instagram photos of my MRE. Oh, actually, I did do one of those, but I didn't put it on Before Instagram existed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, does that cover your question? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so you know, let's go into a little bit more detail about you know what was the the photographs specifically. So you said it was a series of photographs. So I mean, yes, it's a series. That went into capturing well, those photographs. Well, in the Pulitzer Prize, you can uh, for a portfolio, uh, you can have up to twenty images. Oh wow! Okay. okay? Right, up to twenty to make the portfolio. Um, so. And I say this, believe me, well, what, I'll just talk. Um, so it's a series of images. I had 15 images in the portfolio. And they run the gamut of the impact of the war upon civilians uh, and, of course, soldiers and the war itself. And I think uh, one of its strong points might perhaps be for both Cheryl and I is that because of our um, assignment to these tip of the spear situations where, for instance, the vehicle I was in was an armored vehicle. Um, uh, I think it, w it was the seventh vehicle from the front. So you had six Abrams tanks and then this little vehicle I was in, which was a command vehicle, meaning the commander wasn't in it. He was in the tank ahead of me, but um, it, it was radio communication. The Air Force guy was there and the Army guy was there. They're watch the Army guy's watching mortar and making sure no one's lobbing mortar onto uh, the troops. Now, that's one of Cheryl's photo right there. Uh, and you get my point. See, this is like, and I'll just jump to the point. The point was, is that um, uh, in war photography, uh, it's very difficult. It's, it's not as common to see war actually occurring. It's usually, and I hope I'm not wrong, I hope people don't take offense to it, but I mean no offense, and I don't think it's offensive to say that it's mostly aftermath stuff, and believe me, yeah. that's powerful stuff. I mean, my gosh, um, I'll just, a quick side. I remember a Time Magazine photograph by one of my colleagues, and darn it, I can't think of the name, but it was so powerful. It was from Bosnia. And it was well after it was a funeral. I I couldn't look at it. I had a subscription at the time, and I tore the page out uh, with his photograph on it and threw it away. Um, it was that disturbing. 
And that's a high compliment. And that's not to say shooting sensational images. Sensationalism is not what captures people's hearts and minds. It's this stories. It's the identification that we make with images itself. That's the story of photography. Photography is unique in that sense that it gives us not the beginning, middle, and end, but it gives us this slice of life, this little tiny moment uh, that, uh, that, that we recognize as being a moment. And the strongest ones uh, have universal appeal meaning that anyone could look at this around the world and identify with what's happening in some regard. Um, in this case of this photograph that I tore out, I mean, it was a child grieving the loss of his father, I believe, and uh, it was dreadful. And why? Because I, let me back up and just say, I'm going to compare it to video, which I video, so it, certainly no disrespect for video, because it, it's just, in one regard, it's different in that video tends to give us the narrative beginning, middle, and end to an image which doesn't, doesn't necessarily, it may, it may suggest a beginning, it may suggest an end, but it doesn't really spell it out for you. And so what do we do? What are our minds made to do? They fill that blank. We bring our own personal narrative to images. And I think that's one way that they gain their power. Because what do I see when I see a child grieving like that? My heart goes out because I have children or I've had children or I know children or you know, I have a niece or nephew. You get my point. It goes on and on. And worldwide, isn't that something that most people, by and large, know? So what is photography? Photography is uh, the very best photography tends to fall upon those universal themes of uh, um poor and rich, uh, love and hate, um, uh, healthy and infirmed, uh, uh, hungry and uh, plentiful. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Um, I once was teaching a class at the University of North Texas in Dallas, and I did a certain complete breakdown of all of many of those major themes and then divided them up. And the interesting thing I found is that let's just take love, hate. Okay. Although the exact opposite of love is probably not hate. It's actually indifference. It, yeah. To be indifferent to someone is more the, I mean, if you're hating someone, you've got something invested in them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and, and hopefully we don't hate, but we do know it exists. So anyway, but let's just use it as a thematic uh, uh, explanation, love and hate. Well, where would we place love if we put it in terms of life and death? Well, love would fall upon the lines of life, right? And hate would be, we would think it's darker. It's a darker view of the human experience love is brighter in that sense although as we all know anyone who's fallen in love knows that well it certainly has its dim moments if not complete blackouts but <laughs> but you get the idea and basically photojournalism in that sense thematically can be divided into life and death try it out sometime and see what you think Definitely, definitely. I will. I will do that immediately <laughs> yeah, after the show. Um, yeah, but, you know, yeah, yeah, you know right I, the the pictures are very profound, very well done, and I think you know showcase uh, both you know the good and bad sides of the conflict. I mean, or at least you know as good as they could be, I guess, in certain instances. But obviously, a lot of tragedy, a lot of death and whatnot, destruction. You know, but obviously, you weren't the only photographers out there on the ground covering this war. I mean, it was probably a pretty well covered war. Uh, you know, did you have any idea that your imagery would be the one sort of selected for the Pulitzer? Did you know? Did you see your peers' imagery and think like, "Oh, this is has a, a shot of winning"? You know, what I'm trying to say is like, 
you know, you were you know, providing some very strong, powerful imagery. Did you have any idea you would win? And what do you think set you apart from everyone else who was out there taking pictures? Well, first off, I think we have to establish something early on in the way you're thinking. I would say, to be honest, it's a proper way of thinking. And that is that I never went out to shoot an award. I mean, that's not how it's done. It's done through all of the fundamentals and the, and the experiences that over time accumulate in, in our lives. And it's, I mean, the, to be honest, uh, if you can't learn to recognize the moments that occur in your own life, how are you going to show me moments in someone else's life? I mean, so you get the mindset that goes on there. It's, it has nothing to do with going out to shoot Pulitzer. So when I'm going to the uh, second goal for, I was at the first one too. And in both of them, I had the same mindset. I'm not there to win a Pulitzer Prize. I'm, I, it's, it's probably the furthest thing from my mind. Um, certainly, it, it, the closest that I've ever been to that type of thinking is so generic that you wouldn't even typify it as that type of thinking. And it was more about the excitement and the newness and the, the fantastic things that happen as a photojournalist, a daily newspaper photographer, when you're sitting on the front row of life's daily dramas. Well, let's face it, anything could happen at any day. And that could end up as a Pulitzer. But you see, I never thought like that, and certainly not going to the second goal for it. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, is that I had uh, been working uh, for the Dallas Morning News as, you know, as one of the beginning pioneers of, uh, for newspapers. And um, that started in 2000. So they took me off of the regular assignments. And for from 2000, 2003, I made very few images. And I told my wife right before I left to go on this uh, to Iraq, I said, man, I, just, I hope I just don't embarrass myself because I haven't touched the camera. In fact, uh, I didn't even have the latest cameras um, that were being used at the time. I, I think I had a D30 still, and they gave me something else. I forget EOS. What was it? EOS 1D or D1 or something? No, 1D. Which, no gosh, can you believe that? I think that's like what seven megapixels or something. <laughs> yeah, what about uh, I mean, I, 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 Nikon shooter. 1D? I think that was like five megapixels. I don't yeah. even remember. Yeah, maybe been five. Six. I, all I know is that the iPhone is far surpassed it. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, a little bit. So I was more concerned about that, to be honest, if I was thinking of anything personal. But aside from that, I said something else to my wife that I think kind of really gets to the to where my mind was at the time. And that was, of course, number one is to tell the story uh, as best I can, to tell the truth as best I can. And telling the truth simply means that I'm going to operate in the context because truth is within context you step outside of context and an image a single moment could say one thing when in fact that wasn't really the truth uh, it's the whole illustration that people learn in for journalism school today uh you know it's the uh, the the tight shot of seats that are filled row to row and suggesting a packed out the crowd at the stadium or the whatever event it may be, as opposed to a wider shot where we see that actually one section that's cropped in, uh, the only packed section in the entire stadium. You get my idea. That's context. And context plays an enormous role. So, but I went there for that. That's obvious. Uh, it should be obvious. The second thing, though, was, was personal. And it was, I just mentioned, not to embarrass myself. It really was a concern. People down. Uh, didn't want to let myself down. But I also thought, 
you know, I just want to experience the joy of having a camera around my neck again. To have those cameras draping across my neck and my shoulders dangling there like they did for so many years is a passionate experience. If you just stop long enough and just appreciate it. Of course, then again, I'm a guy that used to pick up, oh, I'm, I bet you one, one or more of you have done this. You pick up the camera, you talk to it, put it in quiet whispers like a lover, and you kiss it. I kiss my camera and I'd be like, this is, this is our moment. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Or, you know, if you're at a football game or something, you're like trying to do like mega rays, you know, mental brain waves that's connecting telepathically to the quarterback. Throw, throw to the right, throw yeah. to the right, you know, whatever. But I really wanted to experience that joy. And I believe I did. It was amazing. Then finally, as just a matter of practice, as just a matter of my purpose, I should say, not practice. I was in contact, of course, on almost every day by sat phone because I was sending images back. So I was able to speak with my wife and what have you. Um, and she would begin to tell me where my images were and how they were played. And I said, you know, I don't really care about that. I'm not focused on that because I remember saying, I'm not going to shoot images with any of that in mind. I want to shoot only simply for the image, for the experience, for the moment, for the truth, for whatever I find, for the observation, for the privilege of having a camera, for the privilege of having this opportunity. So I blocked all that stuff out and I said, no, I don't really want to hear about that stuff. I didn't care. In other words, why does that matter for folks that may have not thought through it or not experienced it? You know, the impact of you think, oh, I shot this great photo. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is front page. It's going to be huge. Oh, man, this is viral. This is the whatever you may think. And then it doesn't even get used. Yeah. <laughs> that can do a little mind thing on you. By the same token, you shoot something that, you know, it's like, really? That page of more than 70 papers nationwide? Yeah. Seriously. So they both can play with you like that. And I didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. So I didn't. Although I will say that the one photo that did play, 70 some odd papers nationwide yeah it was it was one I, i'm okay to have my name under <laughs> and by the way interestingly enough that very evening speaking of video that very evening uh a video i shot uh and i transmitted back uh aired on world news tonight with peter jennings yeah. that very same day that the some images were seen newspapers uh, nationwide. So anyway, so you get the mindset there. Uh, I'm going into it with that. I'm not thinking about anything but those things. And um, anyway. Let me ask you this, David. So, you know, what, what I want to find out is like you've, you've shot your assignment in Iraq. You, you're back in America or wherever you're putting together the imagery for this Pulitzer Prize package portfolio and you know maybe you're showing it to your photo editor or maybe you're showing it with you know someone else some of your confidants or you know your partner in this award you know and are, are either of you ever looking at that set of work or the photographs and saying to yourselves you know what that's some pulitzer prize winning material right there you know we, we are looking at it you know obviously you want to pick your best stuff you want to pick the stuff you think is going to win when you enter but you know is anybody ever anybody looking over your shoulder and saying wow that's that's definitely some pulitzer prize winning material there do you have any idea you might win and or were you just um shocked when it happened and you're just like yeah just throw it up against the wall and see what sticks you know type idea 
I, well, it, there's a lot of that in there, and I like the old thought of we can go and see what sticks, and and that does happen a lot. I mean, um, newspapers send in stuff um, to for judging uh, all the time for the Pulitzers, and that's that's great. But um, fortunately, I worked with uh, some really good colleagues and uh, who themselves are esteemed. And they're able to recognize, you just simply s sort of recognize when work has reached a level of Pulitzer, um, what do I say, Pulitzer quality, the level of Pulitzer prize. Um, and I've seen it in other people's work as well. And very often I'm right. But then again, very often you're wrong. So there isn't any sense of, wow, this is going to win. Uh, especially from a guy like me who's, who's been a finalist uh, it was four times for a Pulitzer Prize and didn't win it so uh, I learned from that as well that I didn't expect anything um, but I did know that the work was strong and, and I can say that I did not think about the Pulitzer whatsoever throughout that assignment and Till briefly, right at the very end of the assignment, or getting close to the final days when I sort of played out my assignment and done what I was sent, I'd completed my mission, so to speak. And it was the first time I was sitting on a cot. It was the first time I'd seen my, my images or sat down long enough to look at them because I've been sending them back every day, which, by the way, I had a goal every day. And uh, this might be helpful for some people. Uh, if you want to build a strong portfolio or if you want to um, build a strong essay, if you want to do whatever, I, I don't I think it's a perfectly reasonable goal to set for yourself to shoot at least one photo that you'd be proud for others to see um, that you think is good work uh, every day, every day. And of course there is uh, what's, oh gosh, I hate to say, what's her name? She's such a nice lady, but started a photo a day many years ago, you know, uh, college students were involved in that a lot. I don't know what they're doing now, but anyway, sort of the same concept, a photo a day. But uh, leaving that aside, that was one thing that I did try and accomplish, is one photo. So in fact, one of the images in the portfolio, the one where um, soldiers are jumping into an irrigation pond, um, there, I had been stuck in in travel most of the day and and I really didn't see anything the whole day and the sun was getting very low on the horizon and I was just sitting there accepting the fact that I'd failed that goal personal goal and you know it's okay because I'm not gonna push it you know I mean it is or it isn't <laughs> so I was sitting there doing something, you know, and I overheard these guys, two soldiers saying, hey, there's some irrigation ponds. Let's go check them out. And, uh, you know, maybe we could jump in or stuff like that. And I said, hey, so what are you guys talking about? And they told me, and I said, so, oh, okay, cool. So I thought, well, what the heck? I'm going to go with them. So I went with them, and it was a – Okay, going down, you had to really jump into this pond. Uh, it was pretty odd to see these ponds in the middle of the desert, but um, they were sitting at the edge of the sort of, well, the big drop-off going down. And they're going back and forth saying, oh, man, that water looks great. Oh, gosh, I'd love to jump in there. Oh, come on, let's do it. No, Sarge would be really upset. We'd get in big trouble. Oh, whatever. Let's just do it. Back to the whole whispering thing. I'm like behind my camera. I'm back now 10, 15 feet. They can't hear me, but I'm going, 
just jump. Please jump. Jump. Please jump. And, of course, I'm doing that because I can't enter into it whatsoever. I mean, this is – because that would be influencing – uh, the, the news, influencing the circumstance, influencing the feature. And it would be lying, essentially, because I'd be the one going, hey, you know, go ahead. It'll be fine. I'll tell the sergeant it's cool and you're doing it. It's good press and blah, your family will like it. Blah, blah, blah. And it would be easy to think that no one would ever know, just the two soldiers and myself. Of course, for me, that matters the most is myself and living with that. Dave, what if you have uh, force powers and you don't know it? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I might. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but anyway, oh, man, was I pumped when they jumped. And I knew immediately that I there's the photo. At yeah. the last moment of the day, I get this photo. And I sent it go. back, and it was a big hit. But um, now, interesting enough, I said that no one would know. About six months after after I'd been home or something, uh, the Louisville Courier Journal decided to do this special section and they chose some of their favorite images from the war and they went and found the soldiers that were in those. And one of those images uh, was those jumping soldiers. Yeah. There you go. And of course, I saw the special section and read what they said and how they're quoted. And it was really pretty fun to read because it was like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And it was really cool because it's like, there you go. What if those soldiers had said, yeah, you know, we really want to, but, you know, the photographer, he's like, oh, yeah, come on, do it. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be right here with you guys right now, and I wouldn't have a Pulitzer Prize either. either. Yeah. So <laughs> my yeah. career would have ended early. <laughs> yeah, <All> right. <laughs> Well, um, let's talk a little bit about the actual prize winning process. Well, you know, yeah, obviously it, it, not all of fact, us get to go to the ceremony. Go ahead. Yeah. And in fact, just to wrap up that whole thing and finally seeing the images for the first time. Um, I thought, oh my gosh, I shot all this. I was actually a bit surprised uh, because I had not thought like that whatsoever. And when I saw it, though, I did because of earlier experiences. I recognized that I wasn't, I didn't have the full story like I needed. There were things that are missing, major elements of that invasion that needed to be done. And I, basically in my mind, I knew immediately it was a couple of things. And predominantly one of them was the looting and the impact on citizenry and their understanding of freedom and all that kind of stuff. Another one was just the impact on children and what have you. And uh, my wife was saying over the sat phone, she was saying, uh, you know, you're done there. Why don't you just come on home? We need you back here. And I said, yeah, I am done, but I need to work this a little bit more because I'm missing a couple of pieces of the story. And so I stayed another three weeks. And in the process of three weeks, it, fortunately enough, by having that focus upon those areas, I was able to shoot the images that were needed. And uh, both of them, uh, of the images that I came up with in those three weeks, both ended up in that portfolio. So there you go. Wow. Which I was thinking about the Pulitzer, but not fully, because I'm also thinking about a full story. Yeah. yeah. All right, Let me ask I'm you, done. you know, you, you've won or you've been selected to, I guess, win the Pulitzer. And I, you know, maybe I don't know exactly how they're done, but do you get nominated and then you go and you find out if you won at the ceremony or do you know before you get there that you won? And then can you, know, you talk a little bit about the ceremony itself and sure, sort of getting the award? Sure, sure. Yeah. And it's really interesting you're asking these questions, David, because uh, I've done a number of interviews and no one ever really asked those questions about <laughs> what is the process? What's it like? I mean, where and what happens? What um, were you wearing? <laughs> well, well, that I can't tell you, honestly. <laughs> Good, I think good, I, I think there's a picture of you getting the award, so I can probably yeah, verify yeah, that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. 
Um, uh, well, the fact is, is that you don't get them at the award. You you win, and then you get them. And the the win is announced uh, via the AP. Uh, in the old days, it would have been the you know the 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 what do you call them teletype machines or whatever that you know I used to watch those things come yeah. off. <laughs> room and the editors would come and rip it and pull fresh copy off and it was I go back to those days hey i started out shooting with a two and a quarter a twin lens reflex but wow. anyway um yeah i'm not old uh <laughs> do you see but, the time david but but so so what happens is is that it's usually usually there's a leak the first leak tells you that you're a finalist. I don't know how the leaks work or, or <laughs> what the process is behind it. This is, I just know what happens. Yeah. And the leak comes out and says you're a finalist. Well, that's pretty good. Um, all, then the day of or the night before, usually it's going to be the day before, you'll probably get a phone call from your photo editor, director of photography, managing editor, executive editor, whomever saying, okay, we, I just want to be the first to tell you congratulations. And that's leak two. But have you ever wondered why there's so many pictures of, in the past of uh, people winning and they're in newsrooms and there's champagne flowing and pouring over <laughs> people's heads? Well, yeah. it's not that newsrooms keep uh, uh, stocks of champagne a lot. <laughs> Are you sure they don't? They don't do that to get through that. Yeah. I, I hear the our profession is very much an alcoholic profession. But well, I, I wouldn't say we're a champagne drinking profession. It's more whiskey. I would no, assume. I would say yeah. <laughs> whatever gets you drunk. That's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah, and and also a family and friends that are there, like my family was there, but those things happen because you learned the day before. Um, but because of my experience, the four times and then finally having won it, I still think about it and till about an hour before we were supposed to be up there about the time that the results would be coming out. And um, I got the phone call from my director, from the director of photography at the time, Ken Geiger, who's now an editor at the National Geographic, um, and saying, congratulations, you've won Pulitzer. And I do remember this. It was a really poignant moment for me. And it wasn't because, oh, yeah, fine, I scored. It was just... You know what it really was? And I know this is going to sound like a bunch of crap. People think, oh, come on. This guy can't be like that. Seriously. <laughs> to be honest, I cared about the images. And it felt to know that the one thing that the Pulitzer Prize does that really not many other prizes do, those images are now preserved. They're available. They're in the public eye. Uh, and they continue to stay there for years and years to come. Yeah. And that meant a lot to me to learn that finally something solidified. Because to be honest, right now, I should be doing, I should have already done it. Um, you know, looking back on my career, I mean, I had an amazing career. And I find it interesting sometimes that I have the reputation that I have, uh, which was garnered a whole a, a large part garnered before there was a Pulitzer Prize. Um, uh, but interesting that it's there because you've seen what I've done over the last 30 years. Not that many really. Uh, why? Well, because the negatives are at the Dallas Morning News or at the Times Picayune. Worse, at the Times Picayune, when I was wanting to get the negatives, I found out that in order to make space, they had destroyed them. Oh. So, uh, and that has happened around the country. 
Uh, there's a number of people who've had similar experiences. Wow. Uh, and of course, the Abilene Reporter News, I don't know. I mean, I did some nice work there too, but, you know, obviously that was the beginning of my career and not, not to the level that I did later. But at any rate, I can't really put my hands on anything in particular. <laughs> not easily. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, I don't know where we were. I've got, sorry, I'm plugging in my. Uh, well, you know, we were talking about the actual award ceremony itself. That's what I, I would want to know. Like, okay, so you, you, you find out you win, then you go to actually get the Pulitzer. What's that whole process like? You know, how does that ceremony go? Yeah. What, you know? Well, well, once, well, once, once you've won it, then you go to the newspaper and family's there. And it's just this amazing, um, uh, experience where, you know, they announce your name in the newsroom and you give a short speech. And I remember mine, though, is that caught immediately with the sense of, oh, uh, you're torn. When it becomes a what they refer to as the war Pulitzer, uh, it's like you're torn because one of the first things that came to my mind fantastic moment that I'm experiencing was the 19 year old soldier who had just been out of boot camp for six weeks when in traveling in the same kind of armored vehicle, which by the way, could be penetrated with a 50 caliber, uh, was hit with an RPG and died. I mean, really, to be honest, why wasn't he at home? And why am I here? Award, but it, so I, I was totally torn. Now, what I said, I mentioned this soldier in my whatever you want to call it, acceptance speech, for lack of better words. Um, but I also was very clear to make sure that no one that I wasn't by feeling like, yeah, well, whatever. No, because it does mean a lot to win a Pulitzer and. But mostly it's because of, um, well, I shouldn't say mostly. I'm just going to say that. And then one other thing you learn afterwards is that it comes with this, um, I don't want to use the word burden, but it comes with a responsibility. Be above the cut as best you can, so to speak. I mean, to be everything that you were and possibly more. And in that sense, it is a huge responsibility and it does matter. So I've been very careful um, ever since the Pulitzer to maintain that because I want to maintain the credibility of not my name, but the images and what they came, what came about as a result of those. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but Fact is, is that the Pulitzer comes with, well, I'll just go ahead and say it, for lack of a better word, comes with a cost. Comes with a cost, okay. And well, I, if you really care about, well, why you specifically care about journalism, the integrity of it. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I'm messing with my uh, power cord here to make sure. No worries, no worries. Yeah. Well, what I want to know is, you know, uh, obviously you, you were announced in the newsroom. You got the champagne and the family and stuff. Right. But in the picture here by the Dallas Morning News, it looks like you're at Columbia University actually receiving your yeah. award. Can you explain oh, yeah. that? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, I keep reading. I keep leaving that part out. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Uh, yes, and then afterwards, a uh, uh, month or so after, then you go to Columbia University in New York where – everyone receives the actual Pulitzer and you go forward and they call your name. And I had my family there, my mother and father and my sister and my wife was there with me for that. So, yeah. That was but, a pretty proud moment for I you, I guess. Why I, I keep, I kept forgetting to mention that is it's not because it doesn't matter that it's not a big deal. It's a huge deal to me personally. Um, on the other hand, biggest moment occurs when it's announced 
afterwards it's just receiving the award and now i don't that's a terrible way to say it just receiving the award i don't want to indicate in any form whatsoever that i'm not deeply appreciative of the entire experience which i am so i just don't know the words to describe it i would just say that it has uh, it is it, it's not i will say this it's not equal to actually learning the first time you won and when i first heard on that telephone call about an hour before going up there to hear it actually officially announced in the newsroom when i heard it over the phone i was certain i i have to admit i mean tears fell from my eyes it was a long time i gotta tell you if i if i ever won the pulitzer prize and i can say this because i know i never will but if i ever did i would i would take that like whatever that medallion is they give you and I would like wear that around my yeah. neck and then I'd leave Columbia University walking around New York City wearing that thing, strutting it around. And I'd go to like restaurants and be like, hey, can I get a discount? I got, I want a Pulitzer. Can I, can I get anything? Yo, how about some, some love, some congratulations, you know? Uh, that's funny. That's funny. How about a drink? Can I get you to get a drink, you know? I want a freaking yeah. Pulitzer, man. Come on. Well, I, I, the, the boss did tell me, the boss did tell me to take the family out and everyone to a really <laughs> nice expensive steak dinner. So I went okay. to the steakhouse and I forget the bill was something like five hundred dollars or something. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I was yeah. like And then he was like, hey, you have fun paying for that. <laughs> uh, believe me, it, this the steak was good, but you know what I really mostly remember about that is that I had this hat that I'd worn during Iraq and blah 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 and I had it that day when I was receiving the books. I left it at the restaurant and it was oh. missing <laughs> and it's gone. Anyway, oh God. but but yeah, I mean, it was nice, uh, but uh, it, it does come with a lot of responsibility. And let me get back to, I'll tell you what, I do not want to lose connection. So um, think about what you're going to ask. I hate doing this, but I've got to get a larger charging block. Oh, dear. Okay. Can you talk for just a moment? Yeah, we'll talk amongst ourselves. Okay, so, just man. a little quick one because I'm at 5%. I'm so sorry. Won't no problem, buddy. Exactly where it is. I'll get it. Uh, no. Zach, what would you, what, Zach? What would you do if you won a Pulitzer? <laughs> uh, probably lose my mind. But uh, um, you know, I mean, that's uh, it's the the interesting. It, it's uh, been interesting because uh, he's you know describing it, and all I'm thinking about the like the handful of because there's like a couple different movies that uh, like the Bang Bang Club, uh, where um, I'm I'm forgetting who the photographer was um he's the one that took the amazing photo of the uh vulture, um, the vulture and the child and uh killed himself sadly later it was carter um but uh like there's a scene scene where they have to wake him up and you know i mean it's 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 funny because there's very few um there's very few moments in photojournalists life outside of like the the action and the war that actually get portrayed on film um other than the winning of the pulitzer i can think of like a handful of different films um, and moments where, like that moment, the guy with the the phone, you know, holding the phone up to his ear, or having the editor tell him or whatever, um, you know, that's it's uh, it's kind of one of the few moments that make that make make our lives cinematic. <laughs> How about you, Ron? What would you do if you won the Pulitzer? I think uh, all of us would cry if I ever won the Pulitzer. I don't think uh, I would cry for the 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 sanctity exactly, of the exactly. award. Wow. Be like, oh wow. man, you give this guy a Pulitzer? Exactly. That's, That's really I mean. mean. Jesus. I think that would be. Uh, <laughs> I'm that would kidding. Be one of I'm the kidding. Surprises, I think, if I ever won, they'd say, okay, they're just handing him out to anybody. Now. <laughs> no, I'm sure it'd be for some beautiful shot and on the beaches of Hawaii. You know, maybe a <laughs> yes, selfie. You don't you have enough of those as it is. That's right. I know. <laughs> what, what the world needs is another beautiful shot on a Hawaiian beach. All it I gotta say be, is. If you, if you get yeah. the award, you got to make sure in your acceptance speech, you know, I want to thank all the little people around the lens.com. I couldn't have done this without you. Sign up for uh, monthly updates. The it undisputed will, you know. best live visual journalism roundtable podcast on the <laughs> internet today. It will be interesting on how, how long it will be before um, a Pulitzer is won with a cell phone photo. Um, that's exactly what I wanted to. He gets because, yeah. Flex. 
one D what, when is it going to be that we get a cell phone Pulitzer? Exactly. I mean, yeah, they've won, um, uh, one world press photos. They've been nominated for different things. I mean, obviously oh, it's all man. part of the game, but, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm back. Funny. I hope I am. Am I back? You're back. You're back. Okay, cool. You came back. Awesome. The exact so, right sorry time. about that. We, Thank we you for coming back. About, we appreciate uh, it. We were just so, talking about gear, David. What? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Gear question, Ron. Go ahead. Well, the, the idea being, and, and Zach brought it up while you were gone, but the, the, you talked about using a twin lens, re, re, twin lens reflex camera at some yeah. point. You also talked about, yes. oh, and then I shot with a 1D, and I don't know what you're shooting now, but at what point will it be, and this is what Zach just mentioned when you, when you were off air, at what point will it be when the Pulitzer Prize is won by a cell phone photograph? Well, you know, that could happen any day. I mean, you have to look back and realize that I believe it was 1982, 83, 84, somewhere in that time period when a television photographer, um, a photojournalist, photographed the crash into the Potomac of the airline and had the picture of the guys being pulled out. Uh, a frame grab from video them being pulled out with um, rescued from the Potomac passengers from that aircraft so uh, the pulitzers themselves are certainly not um um uh, device centric i mean it's not like that gives you greater favor uh, and, and this is a good opportunity even to mention that the importance of the moment uh, it's not it's it's like the well look the oklahoma city bombing uh, the firefighter carrying uh, the child, the dead child out from the wreckage. That was shot by, I believe the guy was like an, an insurance adjuster or something like that, who grabbed his 35 millimeter, ran out of the street and shot, shot, shot the photo. Um, a well-deserved Pulitzer. Uh, so it's not even profession-centric in that sense. Uh, yeah. It's simply looking for... by obviously a very strong powerful storytelling moment and in and i can add something that i've just seen over the years this doesn't come from the pulitzer people at all i i don't have much any conversation with them anyway but uh uh i've noticed that it tends to be not just be that it tends to be also a very strong powerful storytelling moment or moments as in a portfolio a major event mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. not always look at it very often it tends to fall upon big big a lot of people's lives but, but that is not an absolute given uh, yeah. it doesn't always work that way for you instance know. i i'll give you a good example of seeing images and looking at them and thinking this is got, I'm, obviously it's going to be a Pulitzer. But the work of the Dallas Morning News photographers um, uh, during after last year was last yeah last year's police, police shootings. shootings yeah yeah I mean they did a phenomenal job and I just felt like this is a Pulitzer but uh, I think they were finalists but it didn't win but. Yeah, my uh, my uh, buddy uh, Ting uh, was actually the guy that got that got yeah. that shot that went completely yeah, viral, was... completely insane. Uh, yeah, he's oh, totally, he's, a, yeah. he's a stunning photographer. He's really great. Uh, we became yeah, friends. Yeah, we, is, been, uh... we we got became friends at Ferguson of all places. So, um, so. yeah, yeah, we we were, uh, yeah, we were sharing it's... a wireless in a subway. <laughs> I I I I don't. I don't know him, but I know him by name because I'm a Dallas Morning News subscriber. Yeah. You know, and uh, so well, he was an, he was an intern getting that photo. Yes, That's the was. crazy thing. That's the That's right. you know, speaking about professionals or speaking of whatever. You know that right. I, when I saw that image, that was my first thought too. I was like, oh great, well he got that. Um, you know, everybody else might as well go home. That's <laughs> but, right. Um, but yeah. Now I, I'm I, I'm I'm interested though in talking about the uh, going back to the kind of gear question. What was your what was your experience? Because you talked about uh, you know talking with your wife on the on the sat phone. Um, yes. What was your experience different? I'm assuming you shot um, the Angola photos with film since film. it was uh, '94, right? Between right. and you shot Iraq with uh, digital. The first mostly, and, and also the first Gulf War was uh, yeah. was uh, uh, film. 
So what was uh, yes, your what was your, and, what was your experience with that like turnaround being able to you know obviously the the turnaround in ninety four w- was wasn't you know instant um, you know I mean they had internet um, I'm assuming you had some level of internet access to be able to upload your photos uh, you know uh, probably took you know, two hours to upload a Meg. <laughs> but... oh, it, it was, it, you know, the, the thing that I found really interesting about it was, and that I noticed right off, is that by the time I had loaded up at least that current type of gear, in other words, today it would be less weight and less this, but it was <laughs> so much weight, so much space. I had almost nothing for personal items. So I pretty much wore the same pair of pants uh, every day for all the time I was there. Uh, it was pretty <laughs> nasty. And when I say I had socks, socks, I'd never worn socks that you put on every day. Same thing. That I could pick them up by the heel and then stand straight up. That's how nasty. Yeah. Where just zipping up a sleeping bag was like a really a kind of you had to take the last gulp before you'd get in there. But uh, at any rate, uh, it was a lot of gear to carry. And uh, the satellite gear at that time was pretty large also. Not to mention, don't forget the laptop and uh, the batteries. And of course, it, it turned around one thing because double A's have always been readily available, plentiful in virtually any place you go anywhere in the world. I yeah. mean, I've seen them in villages that consist of like four people, you know, and they have a little store and there they are. Um, but not so with all these rechargeable batteries you carry. So I had to carry inverters and uh, the extra batteries. And that was really the the challenges every day was making sure how am I going to find power today mm-hmm. so I've got to yeah. power my laptop yeah. I've got to power a sat phone I've got to power my cameras yeah without power I'm dead in the water yeah um so and at the time I was also had a video camera I insisted upon a brand new video camera that would be more appropriate for the war I think I got a Canon G16. Was that the model? Or no, G, no, no, G1, G2. Yeah, that would have been about that era. Yeah, <laughs> that era. Yeah, yeah. Back in those days, yeah. um, but it got fried from dust in the first three weeks. Yeah, yeah I would but, assume so. And I actually <laughs> wasn't made for it. Yeah. yeah, I did. I did a. I did a couple of uh, short documentaries about the war. Uh, two of them. Um, both of them around 30 minutes in length, but I finished, uh, one of them by borrowing, um, some combat camera dudes that showed up one day Yeah. here. Um, they have their cameras. It was XL1 or XL2. I said, oh, man, oh. could I just borrow that for an hour? Cause I knew yeah. what I could go do just to wrap up what I needed for the film. Um, so I did that, but the craziest thing. You remember their names that, by any uh, chance? Uh, what was that? You remember their names? Uh, no, I don't. I don't no. remember their names. No, <laughs> I, I mean I have their names, but I off the top of my head, no. Um, but then the craziest thing though was is it was shortly after my camera crapped out on me. Um, a network crew from. NBC showed up and they were traveling with the 101st division. Uh, I was with the third infantry division. Um, anyway, out of Fort Benning in Georgia. So up and this guy's like trying to scope out the situation because there'd been a lot of fighting and it was uh, pretty intense. Um, and he says, so, you know, where's the commander? Because he spots a journalist and he comes straight to me. Um, and so I tell him, give him a lowdown. I said, yeah, I'm, we are getting some, uh, you know, this area is getting um, pretty much daily mortar rounds, but their targeting isn't real good. So it's really nothing to worry about. It usually falls off in that field over there or, you know, so, okay. So it goes off and he's with, and, and then I mentioned to him, Hey, you know, I had a camera. Uh, you guys happen to have a camera. 
<laughs> I don't know why I would ask that. He says, "Yeah, we got a whole bunch of them." You know, a little. <laughs> and he says, "We'll be happy to have you as long as as long as uh, NBC gets your footage first. <laughs> you know, and I said, "No problem, done." Anyway, so he goes off to see the commander. What happens next? Dad gun mortifier rains like hell from fire and just lights up the entire area dead on. And uh, I ran so hard. I happened to be, oh gosh, yeah. I'm gonna back up and I'll get straight back. Don't let me forget to get back. But the fact is, is how many of us have had photojournalism nightmares? Yeah. Um, and that's the times where, you know, something huge is happening. It's a big deal or something really important. And you open your camera if back in the film day, those nightmares were, there's no film. Where's my film? Looking for film. Or it's like, I don't have a camera. And you're running around borrowing a camera, which backing up yet again. I'll, believe me, that's the way I talk. It drives my wife insane. But believe it or not, I, I have left on two or three occasions uh, on daily assignments for the Dallas Morning News out, out of town and forgot my cameras. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I have crawled around at night in a small town in particular. I remember that one the newspaper. I start with their local newspaper and then I would work mm -hmm. down and it ended up to be some friend of a friend <laughs> who works in copy editing at the paper. And yeah. that's how I covered the assignment that, that particular <laughs> time. It, yeah, it was crazy stuff like that. So we'll get back. So yeah, so that's a nightmare. Well, during that mortar raining down, I lived a photo nightmare. And it, it was because, well, one, I didn't have my helmet on. <laughs> yeah. and, but when they started falling, I ran like crazy and dove into the back of this armored enclosure. And I remember diving and seeing over my left shoulder that area where I'd been just was ripped to hell. Wow. The stuff was just just ripped. You could see it everywhere. So it was close. And then I'm thinking fragments, all this happens in a millisecond in your mind. Mm -hmm. And then I hit the ground so hard, it smashes this GPS thing I had. Um, and all the smoke, you can't see anything, you're coughing, breathing. <gasps> and you hear some people saying, is everyone okay? Is anyone hurt? And it's like, I'm reaching around trying to find my camera. I can't find my camera. Oh. It makes me, I'm just like, yeah. I'm saying profanities. <laughs> I can't find my camera. Where's my camera? And I'm looking everywhere that I would normally keep it. And it happened to be on the other side of the vehicle outside, <laughs> but God, oh, oh yeah. man. So anyway, so this guy during that bombardment, what I look up and there's the dudes, they're running like hell along with the whole 101st. They clear out of the area because, you know, they're not set up to take that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're not an armored unit. Yeah. So and I'm like, the camera, you know, <laughs> it didn't happen. So oh, I don't know where we were before I started off on my tirade. But uh, <laughs> And by the way, sometimes I think when I'm talking, I think, that guy sounds totally like he's stoned or drunk. I can honestly tell you, I don't drink. And I certainly don't do any recreational. Drugs, so this is just me. I mean, I'm born with this. <laughs> One reason why, you know, I, I just pure you, David. Hey, guys, David, let me ask you this: So you you get the award, and you go back to your daily life. How how is your career, your life affected by receiving this award? Does it open doors for you? Because that's the thing you hear a lot about: is that yeah. you know it doesn't really change a lot, but does open doors? Is that true? Did it, did it have any effect on your life after well, you won? Yes, it did. That's an excellent question. And uh, it's surprising to most people, the answer. And um, yes, it did affect me. I had a pretty, pretty darn good freelance business with a number of clients uh, prior to the Pulitzer. They just stopped calling. I didn't get any calls and went to hell in a handbasket. So I started hearing from some of my colleagues and other friends and freelancers and stuff that say, yeah, I referred you to a job, but 
they would they, so i started asking around what's going on and they'd be like but they said oh no he's okay and i'll get to the three out through my just checking i even called a few former clients to see what's going on because i knew when my work had just vanished after the pulitzer it was one the three reasons he's too busy yeah okay yeah <laughs> well everybody's busy okay but uh, i'm not too busy to go and shoot even a uh you know a grip and grin for 250 or whatever they'll pay me um well no i had decent rates but they were fair rates they were what freelancers are charging it was in line um so he's too busy or the second one was he's too expensive yeah it's like why would you say that i and i did not raise my rates whatsoever after pulitzer so that some people only go, why not? And I'm like, <laughs> well, <laughs> what good would it do when you've got no clients, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it is, it's beneath him that they'd be too embarrassed to ask me to do like an awards banquet or something or, uh, you know, or mug shots or whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, and the crazy thing is that none of those things were true other than being busy. But I'm no busier than anyone else. In fact, a lot of times I've just found myself being busy because I'd be bored to hell if I didn't, right? So, yeah. but and unfortunately, I've discovered the uh, binging. So I, I can also find myself very busy doing that, you know, one episode after another on Hulu or Netflix. Or <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's interesting to hear but, it was sort uh, of a negative it, effect it, on your life. It did, it did affect it. Well, in that sense, it did. Yes, it, it really did have a negative effect. Uh, the other one I've already mentioned earlier, and that was the responsibility that comes with it. But that one, I, it is a burden, but it's a, it's a welcomed burden because that's simply a continuation of my career and the importance of me of being a credible photojournalist and ethical photojournalist, a, a truthful photojournalist. And I use the word truthful um, carefully. I, I usually say it this way, truth as best I can know it. True or truth based upon the perspective that I had. Um, Cause I don't, I, I don't claim to be the arbiter of truth. <laughs> like I've gone, I should, that's true. Well, of course the photograph and that says doesn't lie, but photograph can lie. In fact, in Iraq, uh, I had a situation where a photograph did lie. Not one that was in the paper or anything, or certainly not the Pulitzer, but it was a scene where they had checkpoints and these little boys were coming up and they had little sacks in their hands. And of course, everyone gets searched, including little boys with sacks. And the searching little, little boys are really scared it shows on their faces and you've got these soldiers and they look really menacing with all their gear and the weaponry but within seconds within just mere seconds of shooting that photograph people knew what these soldiers were saying they were like oh man this sucks these kids are so scared oh man i don't want to do this oh I, oh, I hate scaring kids. They were saying stuff like that. And then they were like, do you have any candy? Candy, you mean And so then they gave the kids candy. So, so in other words, the, the one image shows these terrified children, these menacing looking soldiers. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, when I tell that story, people think, oh, he's trying to protect the soldiers. No, I'm not. I'm trying to protect the truth in context. Because yeah. it wouldn't be true. And I didn't even send that photograph out. And believe me, I struggled with it because I thought, well, I could send it out and then show the aftermath. And I thought, that will never happen. Yeah. Photo. Someone around somewhere in the world will use one photo. And you know yeah. which one it'll be. It's not going to be the candy one. So I simply didn't send it. And I think it was the right thing to do. And, you know, years before, uh, many years before in Dallas, Texas, uh, there's still a lot of racial divide. Of course, there's racial divide in our nation, unfortunately, even to this day. Um, 
hopefully, God willing, there'll be an answer one day. But nonetheless, in certain communities at certain times, it can be even stronger. And in Dallas, at one point, it was really strong. Of course, I'm not suggesting that it's not strong today. Uh, I, I mean, I do and I don't. But yeah, it's strong. <laughs> Anyway, let me ask you this, David. But what I'm saying is, I had a cop and they arrested us. I was following cops around. And it's this great picture. Oh my gosh. It's one of those photos that you just sort of like think, oh my gosh, now that's an image. And it's this dude, he's clamped his hands around this uh, black uh, lady, an African American woman, and it's a white cop. And he's clamped it around tight. He's choking her. And then he slams her down to. Put it in the car. That's pretty provocative. That's sensational. The problem was that there wasn't much truth to it. Yeah, the image itself. He did do that. He put his hand on her neck and got. You know why? Because the woman had fistfuls of crack and was mm. trying to eat mm. all of it. <laughs> oh my God! So you yeah. see. They were doing everything they could to take control. Anyway, enough of that. So truth is in context. I mentioned that earlier. Let me ask this, uh, David, you know, uh, obviously, what would you tell someone like myself or Zach or Ron or, or any real, you know, any Joe, Bob or Harry or Sally or Janine, anyone, anyone listening who might be thinking to themselves, you know, this, this whole Pulitzer thing, it's out of my reach. There's no way I can win it. You know, is there anything you could tell them to say, like, no, I mean, these are the things you have to do. If you want to try and win a Pulitzer, you know, these are the things you have to do. These are sort of the... The, the rules or the tricks or whatever that, you know, the, that you would do if you even wanted a chance to win. Like, what would you tell somebody who, some aspiring photojournalist, even though, you know, they're not, we're not shooting for Pulitzers, but if, if I want to even be considered for a Pulitzer, what, what kind of like strategies or tips or tricks or, or whatever, what do I have to do to win a Pulitzer? <coughs> well, um, What? <laughs> That's amazing. That's basically it. I mean, it. I, I I mentioned it earlier. And I'm not trying to be try. I'm not. I'm not trying to avoid. I'm not trying to avoid the question because I'm not. But the fact is, is that it doesn't work that way. Yeah. There isn't any <laughs> tip or trick to it. It is about daily journalism. It is about going out and making great images. It is about caring about people. It's about being involved in people's lives. It's about learning your own moments in life so that you can recognize them in others. It's about being sensitive to those things. It's about developing your passion, your, your experience itself of photojournalism uh, and photography also. Uh, and it, I know it sounds strange to separate photojournalism and photography, but there is some separation, but not entirely. I mean, it, you're still using a camera. It's about it, enjoying that camera around your neck and learning to live and breathe as it lives and breathes as best you can. It's about being breathing and thinking photojournalism 24-7, 365. It's about the voting yourself to something that may or may not pay off, but it does because it makes one change anywhere. If it can even cause someone to stop during their morning coffee or something, and an image of yours could motivate some father or mother to simply turn to the children and say, I love you, then you've done something. It matters. In that sense, this whole goal of bringing change, and I think every photojournalist worth their salt, and I would say 99.99%, .99%, if not all of, them, of my colleagues, feel that way, and that is they want to make a difference. They want to bring change. They want to do something, but you've got to realize there are, you, you can't forget one is the change it's doing to you. That's important. But two is that one person matters. If you think about it this way, if you could do some act and save a bus of, with 25 kids on it and save their lives by doing something, would you do it? And it means you're, it's going to cost you your life, okay? I forgot that important detail. <laughs> <laughs>
devils. So would you sacrifice devils, yourself right? to save a bus full of 25? Yeah, children. 25. Okay. <laughs> the, Is that what you're you know, asking? If, well, if I, if I, yeah, they're all photojournalism students. No, let's <laughs> not do that. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> uh, absolutely yeah. not. That's joking. competition, Sorry. man. But, but, <laughs> That's life. But, 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 yeah, exactly. You might just say, no, it's, there it is. There's the exit. Uh, no, this is that naturally dark, dark humor. But anyway, um, question of a group of people, almost every hand's going to go up. Mm -hmm. that they would. And, and that's important too to note because I found that most people do care. It's not that they don't care, it's that they don't know how that changes. They don't know what to do. It's not that they don't give a rip about these issues that's what do they do about them and that's one of the things that photojournalism can do is provide something of a bridge to allow people of different sections of d different beliefs different uh, religions different whatever to, to just bridge the gulfs and gaps and the chasms between us that exist in society throughout uh, society will always be fractured. You can't expect it. it's going to all one day all be, you know, you know, all singing kumbaya together. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we shouldn't tirelessly work. And so it's about those things. It's about understanding the change it's making in your life, the change you can make. And I can tell you this is that if I ask that question, 25, almost everyone go up. Then I reduce it, and I've done this before. How about only 10 of them? Well, you still get a smattering of hands. Five? A few will go up. How about just one? And that's sort of the way I see photojournalism. It's about the impact of one life. You know, I... Uh, did a, a project about homelessness back many years ago in 1986. Um, it was during the, you know, the height of discussions about homelessness, which I lived on the streets for a couple of months. In the process, I met this guy who was uh, some uh, father in the Episcopalian church or Pres no, Presbyterian, I believe. And he said he went to seminary and he wanted to work with the homeless. He was in Chicago, I believe. And he says, you know, so on fire, so gung-ho. I thought, I, I, I'm just going to make a difference, this huge difference. And he says, and he worked and he worked and he worked and he worked. And he never saw the big changes that he wanted to see. But what he did notice over time was that the one life that would change much. And he says, I really believe, and in those of you familiar with the Bible, the, the whole concept of, uh, in the Bible, it states faith, the size of a mustard seed that can tell the, the mountain to jump into the sea, words, to move mountains with a mustard seed amount of faith. And of course, a mustard seed is teeny tiny. And he says, I really believed it fervently. But then I realized that I, I guess I didn't have that kind of faith. He says, but I had enough to move that mountain to that sea, one shovel at a time. I tell you that with the types of experience I've had, with the dire and horrible circumstances that exist in this world, and some of the stuff I've seen in global conflicts is just, they're, They'll rip your soul apart, and they've ripped mine in many ways. So many times over, nightmares, the whole nine yards, it goes on and on. And I remember one night, tearfully, I was having a bad night. And I told my wife, I said, you know what? But I do believe that I have maybe somewhere, someone, someplace, somehow, that my photography made a difference in their life. And if so, it's worthwhile. And that's what keeps me relatively sane. I mean, I didn't say relatively that night, I just said keeps me sane, keeps me well, keeps me from going all the way over into the deepest, darkest void. It's knowing that somewhere, somehow, just having that belief 
that photojournalism does matter, that it does change lives. And no, it's not the kind of change that we go out and we hope to get. And yet I'm still a fervent believer of that. You know what? Uh, uh, w. Eugene Smith is often referred to as the father of photojournalism, uh, along with Margaret Burke White, of course, um, the father, uh, the, the mother <laughs> of the photo essay. I hate this whole father of and mother of things, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah. It's just a way of saying they were big. These are big people. But W. Gene Smith, that there existed an image or a series of images that could literally change all. I have to say, I adopted that belief early on in my career, and I completely fervently believed it and I believed it about war when I went to conflict I didn't just go there to cover conflict I went there because I expected to do the level of work that could literally end the conflict could could end the suffering could end the injustices could do all these things and that is a big thing to travel with and yet it's a privilege at the same time which is why some people may misinterpret this, but they shouldn't. Said, and that was you say, "Oh, this is a photograph this is never a photograph worth dying for." Are you really serious? If that one photo could end war, yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> look at look at Eddie Adams. For instance, and um, and his image of the shooting of the Viet Cong suspect, yeah. um, along with uh, my friend who, in the process of getting all heated up here, suddenly escaped me. I anyway with the same Saigon girl, you know, with the napalm. Which, by the way, I got to kiss that child's face. Um, where she was 35 or 40 at that time. Um, Nick, I, there you go. Yeah, Nick, we should retire. How can I forget Nick's name? But I was forgetting it. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, so, uh, well, I didn't so know anyway, if you were, you were going to um, go further on your thought there, but I was going to say. say that I was just going to say that historians largely agree that those things helped in the Vietnam conflict. I mean, yeah. it's hard to, to put, I mean, how do you develop the metrics to actually prove that? No, yeah. but it had a major impact. You know, you so, know, when I asked, when I, when I devised that question, David, I thought you would, your answer would be something along the lines of, okay, here are the top 10 tricks you need to win a Pulitzer. You won't believe number seven. <laughs> but anyways, uh, moving on. Not a listicle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, click, little clickbait. There, there, uh, but, you know, there's, there's uh, one of the like things, that. I mean, a lot of us, you know, I would say, you know, personally, if I were to, you know, uh, earning a Pulitzer, winning a Pulitzer, I think would be something I would put on my bucket list. Because once you've done it, it's like, well, check that off. Was that ever something that was in your mind, either before you won it or after you won it? You're like, okay, I got the Pulitzer. I've got the creme of the creme of award winnings, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm good. I can die now. No, any, it, any thoughts it, uh, like that? No, I, probably not. I, I'm gonna say probably I, not. I, no, I mean it, it's it's. It, I mean, I'd be lying to say it wasn't satisfying to win a Pulitzer. But you know, the truth is, I, I, maybe one way to show some of that insight is that we had an intern working at our newspaper when I was on the staff at the Dallas Morning News, and uh, I liked this young man. He was a uh, really good guy and really nice images too. And I had been a part of uh, the team at Katrina in video and they put, but they put together the portfolio and very often during the process of trying to determine what's going to be in it, my images kept appearing and disappearing from those selections. Mind you, my images that were submitted were frame grabs. It, Katrina would shoot video. I was with um, photographers, two of them, 
um, when some of those images were shot. But the Dallas One News won a, a Pulitzer Prize, the, and it was awarded to the staff of the Dallas One News. And I don't send everyone up to Columbia, because uh, at that time, I think the staff was like somewhere between 35 and 50 people. But um, and believe me, a lot of people worked on that project, and it was, it was a tough, tough job. I tell you, that, that's the only time I think I probably was thinking, man, if I could just be back at uh, in Sudan or something. <laughs> I mean, it was horrible, Katrina. But anyway, um, so they very nicely gave us all little crystals. The newspaper did them with the Pulitzer, it says Pulitzer Prize awarded, and it's a photo staff, Dallas Morning News, and then it has my name engraved in it. So it's, I could, I could really, I could claim that as a second Pulitzer, but no, I'm not comfortable with that. It, I didn't have an image actually in the portfolio. Yes, I played a role in the team coverage, but so did a lot of other people. But, so this intern, he was about to leave and it was going away party. And uh, I thought, I'm going to give him that Pulitzer. <laughs> so uh, I wrote on it with a Sharpie. I wrote that the greatest award is a moment noticed. And if you think about it, that's what we do as photojournalists is that we notice we notice the moments. It's not that the moments didn't occur. It's just that we are privileged and hopefully trained and skilled over time to notice them. I used to think of them as whispers or dark room or where I could hear them going, shh, over here, over here. Here I am, find me. I mean, it sounds silly, but that's the honest truth. I I felt like that some of the most powerful moments to be seen and heard, listened to, things that very often seem very subtle to others. And yet, that's our job, is to turn that whisper into a yell or into a very strong voice. And in fact, a lot of times dealing with the disenfranchised in, in um, my career, people very often would appear in front of my camera and I'm, I'm, I'm like the last at their list. I mean, this is the last hope. This is the last chance for help. It's the last thing. That's when that Strap around your neck, feels like it's cutting right through it. Because there's such a responsibility to make sure that you use every skill possible to be this pipeline of sorts that you translate, that you convey, that you see, hear, notice, feel. Your life as a photojournalist transmitted through this pipeline to readers, to viewers. And as I used to express it, I still do, um, is that if I hurt, if it hurts me when I'm there shooting it, if I'm wiping away tears or, or if it's happy, it makes me really happy. This is a great thing. This is fun. This is amazing. Then, but if it hurts, I want you to hurt too. And that's what the image should do, should make you hurt. That goes back to what I had said very early in this conversation about the Time Magazine issue, that it made me hurt. It made me hurt so much. I couldn't risk seeing it again. And that is an enormously high compliment to that photographer. I wish I remember his name. Well, let me ask you this, David, you know, before we get on, uh, we're, we're approaching nearly the second hour of our show. I wanna make sure I give Ron and Zach the opportunity to ask some questions, guys. So yeah, throw it sure to you. Does. Uh, please, you have, a, you have a Pulitzer Prize winner on the line. What do you want to ask? Ron? Oh, well, you know, I got my gear question in. Uh, how about cheap Chinese uh, gear? Do you ever use any cheap Chinese? 
No, I, I've got that. I want to know about cell phones, and you answered it. I'm, I'm good. What? Um. So how do you, how do you um uh what do you what do you like what do you enjoy more now because you know you you kind of uh were at the forefront of the oh the cell phone answer oh yeah yeah, yeah you're right I didn't finish it oh I didn't finish <laughs> sure. it. it I I I sort of finished it but I didn't really nail yeah. it down and that is that. It doesn't matter what device it is, as yeah. long as it's the moment and it's credible, it's ethical, it's honest. Mm -hmm. What difference does it make? How that information, visual information, I think that's where we have to stop and get away from ourselves and understand that we're talking about visual communication. If you think about visual communication and about how you learn, it's very much like how we learn to, we learned English. We learn A, B, C, D, and that's our shutter speeds and uh, stuff like that. Of course, these days, you can kind of fast forward through that, but yeah. <laughs> still helpful to know. But to write a sentence and then a paragraph, and I've watched my children in school, and they go through this process, and then they're writing short essays, little short little pieces, you know, and then they have them write longer pieces. And ultimately, at the end of this list, You've developed the command of language and the skills of writing to speak poetry, mm -hmm. to be lyrical, uh, to speak music in words. It is very much like that. It is a process of visual communication. Of course, it's referred to as visual literacy. And a lot of times how people understand that is that way. But if you think about about some of the greatest use, uses of words and people who have used them well throughout ages, they have that same universal traits to them where even uh, someone who is not learned very least can, can read of the, a similar experience as those who are very educated. And of course, in photography, that's even better because you don't have to learn to read, you just have to see on experience and feel it. So that's my feeling about cell phones. I mean, frankly, I use cell phone a lot. I mean, um, I had with me today, oh, I thought it was here by me. I was out um, just having some fun today, played some indoor golf, which was an interesting experience. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, um, you know, I've used my cell phone for that, but I've used my cell phone for a lot of things, including for some of the freelance jobs that I do. Yeah. It's been upon the nature of what I'm looking for. I mean, a camera is a camera. Well, how, a way to communicate visually. Yeah, that's it. How, how, how do you, uh, it. it has, it has limitations. How, how do you, how, how have you seen the, your work? Because you were one of the early guys to, uh, uh, still photographers to go from, to go with still and video. Now it's kind of, you can't go on a, a job site for a still photographer job for a photojournalist job and not see the extra line. Really good if you have experience shooting video, must know Premiere, must know everything else. How do you, uh, you know, like must yeah. know web editing, must know, and let's not get into that. But um, how did you, um, yeah, right. how, how did you, um, uh, view like what I, I guess like what what do you enjoy more working in which do you ex enjoy doing video work or still or you know well that that's an excellent question uh, and believe me even I ponder it sometimes uh, I will say that in large overall I prefer still photography um, but I think it's probably for very selfish reasons um, and, and the reason I say that is because I enjoy the storytelling aspects of both, which is, as I refer to it, it, when we stop using the word video sometimes, it helps us to get a clearer perspective of what we're talking about. We're talking about still images versus moving images. Yeah. Uh, still photos versus moving photos. And there's a difference. And we're also talking about layers of information. Uh, when I first started out uh, in this uh, for photojournalism, I was shooting triacs, you know, Kodak triacs, black and white film. Mm -hmm. And so what did we have? We had 
Well, we have that layer of information. It was black and white. And of course, the gray is in between. Um, then newspapers began to add color, certainly at the advent of USA Today. This is back in the late, uh, or no, late 70s. Yeah. So we started using color. So color now provided another layer of information. And that information was now I could know that that sweater in black and white that looked really pitch black because it was red is actually a red sweater, you know, because red in black and white is going to look really black. Um, so I found it interesting to look at video as not just moving pictures, moving images, but rather as um, uh two additional layers of information. And that's where the complexities begin. And that is moving images uh, video has motion, obviously, and sound, and sound being the most important of them. But yeah. if you think about it, people think motion, what is motion? They'll say, well, that says a lot. If I take this uh, glass of iced tea, and uh, I walk over to a table, and this is on video, and I nicely set it down. That says one thing. If I walk faster and I set it down firmly and hard, it says something different. Mm -hmm. And yet not a word has been spoken. Of course, audio needs no uh, statement. I mean, it, it is what it is. And we all know it. And the importance of audio is probably the most complex aspect of video. And that is uh, learning to use it well. And, you know, a lot of photographers, when they first start out, they, I see a lot, particularly among, uh, well, no, I'm not even going to say that. Because, man, I found out one time ago, you get into the whole argument with, or I don't want it to be an argument because I don't argue about it. To me, it's communication. Is it going to be black and white or color? Well, man, there are people who, fervent believers in black and white and you don't yeah. want to cross their paths but um <laughs> the fact is that i avoid them at all color. costs <laughs> yeah. i like to color and but color is a, a difficult thing to learn how to use properly and use really well um let's face it i and i know people hate that oh no black and white uh, well okay fine but <laughs> fact is that no anytime you add additional information into what you're handling then it's going to be in intrinsically so with yeah. video uh why do i prefer stills by and large and i said well because reasons and that is because video is that complex it is minutia. In fact, I've taught workshops on editing, video editing, both shooting video and video editing using Final Cut. And when it got to editing, I always said my number one rule, the number one thing to know, the single numero uno, never underestimate the minutia of editing. Now, why? That, that is <laughs> Uh -oh. Hey, that's my folks. <laughs> Whatever I do, oh my gosh. like I, I swear, I, I swear, I don't even drink. It's okay. We'll okay, fix let me pull this back. Oh, Here I am. Let <laughs> just fell off the thing. We'd like to keep it's our audience on our toes, on their yeah, toes. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. I'm, here I am. So anyway, the minutia. Why is that so important? Well, because if you start out and you go, "Oh, I'm just going to knock this thing out." <laughs> It makes the whole process even worse if you haven't already anticipated that, hey, this is going to demand a lot out of me. Yeah. I don't care what length it is. If it's uh, 60 seconds versus 60 minutes, well, 60 minutes can be a lot more work. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, anyway, you get the idea. And, and so that's very selfish because it's really just talking about, I, I like, I like the, the I think we're talking about workflow here. I like the workflow of images. I go, I shoot, I put them in the Lightroom, and I like one element of photography, that still imagery that is so amazing. And that is, get it or you don't. And if you don't get it, you just... Now with video, 
better if you get that moment. Yeah. But if you don't, yeah. it's amazing what editing can do. I mean, yeah, yeah. and I'm not talking about lying, messing around with context. I mean, it's just good editing can make it. In fact, I think the bulk of video work is good editing. And I'm a better editor than I am shooter, uh, which is a <laughs> closely kept secret until today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I didn't want anyone to know that because uh, editing is so difficult. But when we speak about the moment in photography, one thing I began to look at with video is that video offers the moment also. Let's take a 10 second clip. And you know, Cartier Bresson says, you know, uh, uses the term, the defining moment that. Um, and if we, what, what do you call it? That gum all of a sudden just went right out of my head. I've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, the, uh, the what moment? Defining moment. Defining um, moment. Yeah. yeah, I think that's it. That's well, not whatever. It. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what I recognize is that video has those moments too. And that we should recognize them. Ooh, decisive okay. moment. Decisive moment. Yeah. Dear Lord. Decisive the, moment. What the yeah, yeah, journalist yeah. talking about? Wow, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we got there. That's all that matters. Yeah, is we yeah. got there. I had to Google exactly. it, but you know, we got there. <laughs> yeah, we, we finally got there. We, we all know the cartoon. <laughs> the group effort. <laughs> I know, but you know, the most the, the most anal of photographers uh, will <laughs> they're not happy when you just say Cartier Bresson, and it's like it's got to be. His full name, which I can't say off the top of my head. But anyway, um, so back to that. I found that, that oh, it's the decisive moment. Yeah. No, oh, whatever. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, but what I noticed in video is that those moments occur in video as well. So let's look at it this way. You have that defining moment in a single image. And I saw that within Every single best moment you've ever seen, there existed outside that moment. If you could take a picture or an image as having a frame around it, and you could reach a hand into one side and reach a hand into the other side, and you could just pull it out, right? Touch it out. You would discover other moments right there in the context of the one that has been chosen. Yeah. So let's take a 10 second clip. A mother picking up her kids from school. She hadn't seen them all day, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So here are the kids, mother's arms extended outward like this. Ah, oh, there they are, you know, running towards her. What's another one? She reached them, picks them up in the air. That's a moment, right? Still image. Then, she kisses them. That's a moment. And then they walk off hand in hand. That's a moment, a little bit less of a moment, more part of an essay. But anyway, you get the idea. And so I began to think about video in that regard, to think of video as photography, but photography that moves and speaks that's with, with audio, sound. I, I don't want to say speak because images speak uh, as, as we refer to images, and we all know that. But... They speak in a different way. We're talking about actual audio. Yeah. So when you look at it like that, I began to and realize that shooting video and shooting stills were virtually identical. They still required anticipation. They still required finding the moment, you know, finding the angle, the best angle. They required all the skills that have been incorporated for that craft, whether it be stills or video. But yet, within there, the moment exists. May it, it, I called it the extended moment. Um, the extended moment being over that 10 second period, that becomes a moment. Anyway, I could become even more uh, out there uh, because I also began to see video edits as something akin to one moment. 
I mean, it's like a speech. It, very often you will hear the advice being told that if you give a speech, start out with your opening statement, fill in with the body that supports the opening statement, and you end by with your opening statement again. That's your basic body of speech. Any textbook will tell you that. Well, that's what we're talking about here is that in a 30-minute video, somewhere okay that's what it's all about so we have the beginning you can start to see it there then the middle it's nothing but it's all supports it then the end boom rams it home for a win so that is one moment so in other words take that 10 second clip i'm talking about and think of it now in six minutes five minutes Stretch it out for for people who like to sit around and you know wreck their heads at night thinking about stuff like that. I recommend uh, some uh, uh, double doses of melatonin, so that'll help. <laughs> there you go. Well, David, you know we're wrapping up, uh, getting to the end of our our two hour long mega show, uh, and I just wanted to uh, throw it to you. Do you have anything else you'd like to add, or where can people find more about your work? <laughs> Uh, you know, any, any, where, if you want to see your work, where can they go? <laughs> you know what? Just real quick, because you said that, and I'm like, oh, it's so embarrassing. But the truth is, I have actually done a, a, a few talks where I'll say, okay, look, how long you want me to speak for? And I take a lot of pride. They say 30 minutes, boom, I'm ending it 30 minutes, okay? <laughs> Wrapped up, completed. But on a few of them, they've said, no, seriously. And I mean, I'm saying, are you sure? Because <laughs> like, no, no, just keep going. And people will come and go as they want. That's <laughs> One oh, place God. I went six hours oh, from 6 p.m. <laughs> till midnight. And only one person left sometime wow. around 1145 at night. And finally, even I was like, oh, okay. I was like, okay, so anymore. I think we're about done here now. It was crazy. But so anyway, sorry about that. But that's like, No, that's fine. I think, you know, oh. you've, you've given us a master class in, in many different things and ways to see things. I really appreciate that. But uh, where well, can people find out more about your work if they want to, you know, see your work? Uh, your website well, or anything? you know, yes, I do. Uh, I have a number of my own, some like 120 different domains. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Right. But I'm not going to listen. And that's the secret to winning a Pulitzer. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That was it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Based solely on how many domains you there have. There it is. How many domains. Yeah. Better start buying. Um, uh, and top tier if you can find them. But anyway, um, davidleeson.com, uh, if you want to see the Pulitzer stuff, find it pretty easy. Just go to pulitzer.org and uh, go to 2004, the year the award was awarded for the work done in 2003. Um, but I always, I tell people the, the best way, if you want to know more, uh, and I can't imagine you would, but if you do, um, just Google my name. And I don't say that in some <laughs> just mean that you'll know more about me than you ever hope to know. You'll even see my uh, my artwork that I've done for more than thirty years of self portraiture. Um, uh, it's yeah. So just do that, and you'll you'll find plenty enough. So okay, awesome, great, great. Type it in Google. <laughs> Google, awesome. Uh, all right, well, a uh, panelist. Uh, or David, thank you so much for your time. It's well, been thank awesome you. having you. Uh, thank you so much to you and uh, everyone. Um, it was really nice to spend some time with you this evening. You know, we, we loved it. We loved having you on. We'll have to have you on again in the future. You're always welcome well, back. Well, we'll just have to make plans for that. We'll do our six-hour long show next. Yeah. <laughs> Be tuned, tuned in for it next week. Six hours uh, with David. <laughs> David hours. Lisa. <laughs> like, what the guy ever shut up? <laughs> Longest podcast hey, in know, history. Hey, the gift of gab. Did you know? I tell my children, you win more fights with your words than with yeah. fists. Or and, and actually, the truth is, is that I came the closest that I felt like. I thought this is it. This is over. I have seven seconds to live. And I mean, I was running my mouth. 
And right at the moment that I felt like it's going to be too late if they don't let me go right now. And they let me go. And uh, anyway, so words. Words. <laughs> but that so, would be truthful words because people can yeah. spot the faith. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. No problem. Uh, normally at this point, I, I'd let uh, Ron, Zach, and myself, we'd all plug our personal stuff. But you know what? Uh, that gets repetitive every week. So I'm just going to say, if you want to learn more about me, Ron, uh, or Zach, go to aroundthelens.com. We've got bios listed on there. You go to the About Us section. You can find our links and everything on there. Um, so pretty much that's been our show for this week, Around the Lens, episode 75. Uh, I want to thank our uh, esteemed uh, guest, uh, David Leeson, for taking time to be a part of the show. Uh, and again, this has been Around the Lens, episode 75. For Zach Roberts and Ron Hamilton, I am David J. Murphy. Uh, and we are... Out!